have faith that God can. Let me see your hand if you got a need in your life tonight. Let me see your hand. How many believe God can meet that need? Amen. Would you stand with me? I want to welcome, not the first time at the Rock Church, but the first time to minister here. Well, no, that's not accurate either. Because the last time he was here, he was ministering even though he wasn't preaching. Uh, we are delighted to have brother and sister Cornejo, brother Jesse and sister Alexis Cornejo, and their soon-to-be little baby boy. And uh, her mom and dad are very dear friends of ours. They pastor, well, they pastor two or three churches and started all kinds of churches in the Hawaiian Islands. Brother and Sister Sanders, I have had the privilege of ministering in their church. What a, what a wonderful group. And you know Brother and Sister Sanders who have ministered here. And uh, Brother Jesse and Sister Alexis Cornejo, God has anointed them in a very, very special way. And a few weeks ago, I told you about a powerful revival that was unfolding in Hawaii. Well, what I didn't tell you because I didn't know is that the evangelist that was preaching and somewhere over 60, I think it's 63 people have received the Holy Ghost in Hawaii. And the evangelist was Brother Jesse and Sister Alexis, amen, doing a tremendous work. And they are traveling in the United States. They're in California. And you know what? Whenever you recognize an anointing on a young man and woman that God has, has set apart, you better get a hold of them. Because that means God's doing something for a new generation with a new generation. And the last time they were here, I was so impressed. I'm just going to tell you, this is the kind of stuff preachers look at. Brother Jesse was not the preacher. He was just here to see his father-in-law preach and, and connect with them while they were in the mainland. But I watched as this man of God worked the altar like he was the evangelist. That's the kind of things that you notice. There's an anointing that this isn't just about a job description. This is about an anointing on his life. And I, I got a feeling this isn't going to be the only time. Brother Jesse, we love you. We love your spirit. You're a man of prayer. I know that. And, and I investigate. I look Before I let anybody in this pulpit, I do my homework. And we love you. Would you welcome Brother Jesse Cornejo to preach at the Rock Church Well, can we give the Lord a big round of applause tonight? Before we go any further, if you love the Lord and you're excited about what God has done in your life. I said, if you're excited about what God has done in your life, see, if it wasn't for the Lord, I grew up in these pews, I grew up in church, but you know what? It still doesn't matter because I still need Jesus. Every individual here today needs Jesus. We were all sinners one day. But God has set us free here today. If that's you, would you give the Lord a round of applause? Would you worship? Come on, if you know that if it was not for the Lord, I would not be here today. Amen. I'm privileged to be here with you all. And um, I'm excited to be in this house. You can open your Bibles to John chapter 11 and verse 1. And I want to appreciate um, your bishop and your pastor and everybody that is here that has allowed us to come. We thank you so much uh, for the privilege to be here. Last time we were here, uh, we were just so uh, blessed. Um, last time we were here with my father-in-law, and it was a privilege to be here with this church. And uh, I'm just grateful to get to be here. And I also would like to uh, honor, uh, as Pastor Young already did, but my brother James Cornejo. Um, I'm not going to put him on blast, but he is the... Uh, L.A. District Youth President, but he also is single, and he's about 23 years old. Is that right, James? He is single, and he loves the Lord. Can everyone just give the Lord a round of applause for him real quick? Amen. So I think he'll be doing some lobby ministry in the back after service. Amen. Amen. And I also would like to honor my wife, and it's a privilege. I said this wrong one time and I'll never make the mistake again but I said it is an honor for my wife to travel with me and then I realized I messed up and so I'd like to backtrack and I'd like to say it's a privilege that I get to travel with my wife amen can you give her a big round of applause we've uh, been throughout the country a lot of different places 
that are not Hawaii, which she's from, and so anytime you go somewhere that's not like Hawaii, even if it is Sacramento or Elk Grove, you know, it's it's a little bit different. So we gotta, she's gotta adjust, amen. But we're, I'm, I'm blessed to have her with me, amen. John chapter 11, verse one. If you have it, you can say amen. Amen. I'm grateful for what God is doing and everything he did in Hawaii. The 63 people that received the Holy Ghost. And let's give the Lord a round of applause for that. There was a good amount of those that were filled with the Holy Ghost in the prisons. We went into the prisons and I remember one man after about six or seven of them received the Holy Ghost and over here in one group, they're working out. The other group, there's a guy taking a shower right above me. I mean, it's just right there in the middle of everything. And all of a sudden, one guy who wasn't even in the Bible study, he heard the commotion, kind of like what happened on the day of Pentecost. Think about that. They were in the upper room and a guy from the lower room came up and he said, hey, what's going on? These people are, are drunk. And Peter said, no, no, they're not drunk like you suppose. They're drunk in the Holy Ghost. You remember what happened? He said, all right, they got convicted. And Peter said, you must repent and be baptized, every one of you. And they ended up receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost and be baptized in the name of Jesus. Amen. Well, that man walked over and he said, I don't know what's going on here, man. I wasn't in the Bible study. But he said, but I want what he's got. He said, how do I get it? I said, lift your hands, repent. God's going to fill you with the Holy Ghost. In the next few moments, God filled him with the power of the Holy Ghost. It wasn't in a church service. It wasn't somewhere that was staged nicely. But it was where God wanted to do it. Where there were hungry souls. Where there were people that desired more of God. I don't know about you here today. But you don't have to walk out of this place the same. Hell will not win this battle. Jesus, greater is he that is in me than he that is in the world. Come on, somebody get excited about what God is about to do here today. John chapter 11 and verse 1. Now a certain man was sick named Lazarus of Bethany, the town of Mary and her sister Martha. It was that Mary which anointed the Lord with ointment and wiped his feet with her hair, whose brother Lazarus was sick, therefore his sisters sent unto him, saying, Lord, behold, he whom thou lovest is sick. When Jesus heard that, he said, This sickness is not unto death. Somebody say, It's not unto death. It's not to destroy you. This is situation you're going through is not for you to walk away from God, it's not for you to get discouraged or to even take your faith, but rather to build it. But for the glory of of God, this situation, this sickness, this problem is for the glory of God, that the Son of God might be glorified thereby. Would you put your Bibles to one side? Let's ask the Lord right now to arrange our hearts to be in the right place. In the name of Jesus, if you have a need, I want you to thank the Lord in advance for that need He's going to fulfill. There will be miracles here today that God is going to do. If you've got a sickness in your body, He can and He will take care of that here today. Come on, Jesus, we thank you for the privilege uh, to be in your house. Would you anoint my mind and would you loose my tongue, God? I release the gift of faith into this atmosphere right now and revelation and understanding uh, to hit every heart, every believer, every visitor here today. In the name of Jesus, uh, that your will come to pass. Uh, I take authority over every disease, uh, over every sickness, uh, over every bit of depression, anxiety, fear. It's got to go now in the name of Jesus. Uh, if you believe that and you love the Lord, would you just worship? Come on with everything you've got. Would you release yourself in this atmosphere right now? Amen. Turn to your neighbor and tell them you love them. Give them a big smile. Tell them you like what they're wearing. After that, you may be seated. If I get titles, just the next few moments, I'm not a long-winded preacher, so the sooner you respond, the sooner I'll be done. All right, there we go. If I could title this next thought, it'd be all the right ingredients for a miracle. All, right. all the Trinity neighbors say, I've got all the right ingredients for a miracle. 
I was uh, graduating Bible college. I graduated Bible college and was on my way to a service actually here in California uh, several years ago. And I remember that I was just talking to God and I wasn't preaching, but I was going to help work the altars with another preacher. And I remember as we were there, uh, we would drive to the service and, and I began to talk to God. And I said, God, I want to see you do something crazy, something I've never seen you do before. Anybody ever ask that kind of prayer, that kind of anybody? Raise your hand if you're just crazy like that with me. All right. So I said, God, I want to see you do something I've never seen you do before. And I'd seen God heal people's backs and heal certain things here and there. And, and so the Lord responded right away. And so the first part of this message real quick, and this is just a quick commercial. If the Lord responds right away, go big. Right? Because you don't respond right away all the time. Amen. Can I get a witness? And so I said, well, Jesus is talking, so I'm going to talk back real quick, and I'm going to make my faith and request real big. Yeah. And so I said, all right, God, well, I'd like to see you uh, heal cancer. So kind of threw it out there. I'd like to see you heal somebody's cancer. I don't like cancer, and I know you don't either, so I'd like to see you do that for somebody. <laughs> Amen. We know we can do it. Well, I remember the following week, my uh, uncle was diagnosed with cancer. Everybody, oh man. Here's the point. Nobody can receive a miracle if you don't have a need. Anybody that ever received a miracle had a need. There was something going on in their life. So I'm preaching to somebody today that has a need. If everything's going all right, then I might not be preaching to you, but I'm preaching to somebody today that says, man, I don't know what's going on. This thing has hit me like it's never hit me before, and I need a way out. And today, you've got all the right ingredients for a miracle. And I remember I thought, man, I must have prayed this prayer this cancer on my uncle's body. And so I'm, you know, I was a little sad to be honest with you. And I went down to preach at my father's church in Southern California the following weekend. And I remember uh, so I, I walked in and my uncle's the kind of guy in, in the world before he got saved and all that. He was the guy that had nine lives. He's got bullets all in his body and got all kinds of sicknesses and everything else from the drugs he did. And I mean, it's just, he's, he's, every doctor he goes to, they say, man, you know, how are you alive still? He's that kind of guy, you would never know it because he'd be in the hospital bed, he'd say, hey, how are you doing? Let me give you a scripture. Let me tell you about Jesus. He's that kind of person. Anybody know, about, know somebody real strong like that? And I remember I walked in and my uncle never, you know, showing us that he's ever had a bad day. And all of a sudden I gave him a big hug in the back of the church and I said, how are you doing? And for the first time in my entire life, I looked at, he looked at me and just kind of with a little sadness and he just, you know, well, I'm okay. I'm kind of hanging in there. A vengeance got a hold of me and I forgot all about the prayer that I prayed and I remember thinking, man, this cancer is not going to win this battle in my uncle's body because I serve a God that is absolutely, undoubtedly greater than any cancer. And I remember in that altar, I don't even remember what I preached or what I talked about, but I remember in that altar, people were re receiving God, receiving the Holy Ghost, and, 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 and being touched by God. All of a sudden, my uncle was in the back, and, and, and he had his hands lifted up, couldn't move around very much. And all of a sudden, I remember the Lord told me, now is the time. Take the dominion over the cancer in your uncle's body. Curse the sickness. And so I reached back, and I looked at him, and I said, I curse the cancer in your body in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ. And I command it to go. Let me tell you, about three days later, uh, my wife and I received a text uh, that my uncle was completely uh, cancer free. He's been over a year, and there's still no trace of cancer in his body. Uh, this sickness uh, is not unto death, uh, but you've got all the right ingredients uh, for a miracle. Uh, if you've got a sickness in your body, uh, if you've got a problem with your family at home, uh, guess what? Uh, you've got takes uh, to receive a miracle from God. I don't see the sickness uh, as something that's going to destroy me. And that was where Lazarus was. He was sick and all of a sudden he had passed away and they went to tell Jesus and they said, look, Jesus, your friend Lazarus, uh, he's passed away. He's gone now. He's, he's sick and he's going to be passed away. And all of a sudden Jesus comes, you know, the story at a later time and four 
days later, Lazarus has been, has been dead for four, uh, four days. And so Jesus walks in and all of a sudden, as you realize the story goes on, that Jesus walks to him and says, Lazarus, come forth. And the, the thing that really got me thinking was what the word Bethany actually really means. And that town, the name of the town that they were in, Bethany, the word actually means house of misery. And it got me really thinking because you know what? They had come from the house of misery out to talk to Jesus, the source of life. And when they come to talk to the source of life, they walk back probably with hope. But by the time they got back to the house of misery, they allowed their environment to go ahead and afflict them and to intervene with their belief and with their faith. And that's why Jesus came and was, you know, was sad or so about their, their lack of faith and, and so on. But I want you to realize something, that even if you are in the most miserable state, you know what, let me rephrase that, because you are in the house of misery or because you are going to the trial of your life this sickness is not unto death but rather you got everything that it takes for Jesus to come down and to say Lazarus arise right I don't know if you're hearing what I'm saying but you can be going through the worst situation of your life you can be going through the worst trial of your life that cancer may have diagnosed somebody here recently but guess what you've got all the right ingredients for a miracle you don't feel like worshiping well right now is the time to worship God why because I've got a problem I've got a need but because I've got a need I've got all the right ingredients for Jesus to walk in the building and to set me free because I've been dealing with depression I've got all the right ingredients for Jesus to set me free here today Somebody give the Lord a big round of applause. I feel faith rising in this building. God can do absolutely anything here today. Doesn't matter where you are or who you are, God can do it here today. As we were in Missouri not too long ago, there was a, a woman that had come. And the, uh, the pastor told me, he said, you know, we, this, this is my cousin, and she had not been in church for over a year. And we happened to be in Missouri. We weren't even scheduled to preach there until about a week prior, which doesn't always happen, you know. But I realize sometimes when you don't, uh, things happen like that, you know, just all of a sudden sometimes it's, things powerful happen. I don't know why, but it just seems that God really wants you there beyond the shadow of a doubt. And so we were there even when we weren't supposed to be. And it wasn't in the schedule, uh, if you if you want to say that. And I remember all of a sudden the pastor, uh, he told me, he said, you know, this is my cousin here. And she's blind in both eyes. She burned uh, the cornea in her eyes. And, and, and she actually decided to come to church one day out of an entire year that she had not been to church. And that just so happened to be the day that the Lord said he would do a miracle. I don't find it a coincidence that you're here today and that you've got a need. Am I talking to anybody in this place? I don't find it a coincidence that you're here today in this particular night. Some of you maybe were tempted not to come or were tempted to be here but not be here in your mind or in your spirit or in your thoughts or with your heart. But I guarantee if you activate that yourself, your spirit here for a moment and plug into what God is doing, God is going to do something great for your life here today. And I remember all of a sudden in that service, he called me over and he said, here, come and pray for her. She's blind in her eyes. And I remember I'll be coming completely honest with everybody, real transparent, I kind of stayed away from the blind lady. Uh, I'm the only person that's real here, I guess, you know. As the preacher, you don't always go for the one in the wheelchair, am I right? Kind of start off with the headache. I, I'm just unveiling everything right now. Kind of start off with the one with the foot pain. You know, oh, you feel good, all right, praise God. Yeah, foot pain, hey, praise God. Then the wheelchair start getting up, you know? Can I get an amen from somebody? All right, all right, you know what I'm talking about. And so I was on the other side, you realize that, I was on the other side of the blind lady. And so the pastor came, he grabbed me. And I said, yes sir, yes sir, I'll come right on over. I want you to pray for her. And he put me right there. I said, all right, well if you said it, then God can do it. I believe you. Amen? That's how authority works, you know. If they submitted, you'd be all right. And so I remember all of a sudden as I was there, 
And when I walked up to her and I said, all right, well, God's going to heal your eyes. You believe that? She said, yes. I said, you want God to heal you right now? She said, yes, I do. And, and I said, all right, go ahead and lift your hands and we're going to pray. And I began to command her to see in the name of Jesus and, and speak faith and, and command her eyes to see. And the next moment, I remember she looked at me and I asked, how do you feel? How do you feel? And all of a sudden she said, well, I, I can see blurry. I can see, I can see blurry. I see people. She went from pitch black to blurry. And I said, well, Jesus prayed for a man, put the hands on the man, right? And the man said, wait, I see men in the streets. And I said, so if Jesus prayed again, well, I'm going to pray again. I don't know about you, but I'm not giving hell the benefit of the doubt that I'm just going to pray once and pray again. She looked up and she looked right at me and she said, I can see the color of your shirt. That lady came in blind. something to destroy me. People leave church because they got sick and they didn't get healed the first time. People leave because, oh man, it just don't feel good. I'm going through a trial right now. No, no. Let me tell you something. Your situation, like my uncle, was only a setup for the miracle of God in his life. Your situation is only a setup for the miracle of God in your life. That's all it is here today. It's not unto death, but it's so that God can be glorified through your situation. I remember there was a lady in Southern California who began to preach and the power of God was moving and people were being touched and depression was leaving and fear and so on. People are dealing with that a lot nowadays. And I remember all of a sudden uh, I asked the lady, you know, how, how did God heal your body? What happened? And we didn't really pray for her at all, but the power of God was moving so strong she had her hands lifted up in the altar. This is just a few months ago. And I remember all of a sudden she was there and I said, how did God heal you? And she said, well, uh, I, I begin to just worship God. And she said, I've had arthritis in my hands for years. She said, my hands have been crippled. And I remember all of a sudden, let me give you a little background story. I have prayed for arthritis to leave. We have seen people get out of wheelchairs and I thank God for every miracle he's done. We've seen people get out of wheelchairs and blind eyes open and deaf ears open and, and different cancers leave and, and all these different incurable disease and so on. But I, I prayed for arthritis to leave. I stayed one time here in Northern California and I was praying for a lady. I remember a few years back and I was trying to stretch her fingers out because her hands were locked up with arthritis. And I believed that God would do it. And so I stayed with her 30 minutes, 40 minutes. 45 minutes at the altar in the name of Jesus, the name of Jesus. And I'll be 100% honest with you, nothing happened. And I've prayed all the time since then. My wife is a, is a testimony to this. We prayed for arthritis, prayed and prayed and prayed and believed that God would heal it in different places. And he's healed the pain of it, but then the, the muscle cramping still there and so on. And I remember all of a sudden, without me even laying hands on the lady, I said, has God healed you? And she said, yes. Uh, look, my hand in front of the entire church, she got up on that platform uh, and began to go like this, uh, showing that, that arthritis uh, had completely left her body. But that sickness may have been with her for a long time. But she had all the right ingredients to receive a miracle. You might be going through the worst problem of your entire life. You might have a need here today. But guess what? you got all the right ingredients for a miracle. Does anybody believe what I'm talking about here today? 
Is anybody with me here today? If you believe that God's going to do it in this place, if you believe that God's going to touch your need, I'm not talking to your neighbor next to you. I'm talking to you. Yes, saint of God, the one that's been here for 40 years, the one that's been here for 50 years. I'm talking to you. You don't got to live with that anymore. You've got everything it takes to receive a miracle. Sometimes we think that it's for the person next to us. Oh yeah, you can heal everybody else, God. But when it comes to me, I, you know, I know it don't work that way for me, God. When it comes to me, I'm not 100% sure you could do it for me. Guess what? He's the same yesterday, today, and forever. So if he called light out of darkness in the beginning, and he can call light out of your darkness today. I remember... One, one other occasion, we were in Hawaii, and uh, I think Pastor Young, my father-in-law, tells this story all the time. I told him to stop telling it, or else I got nothing to preach. And I, uh, so Pastor Young's gonna know the story, but he's probably gonna worship and shout with me, amen. And I remember uh, as we were in Hawaii last January, we were there for the first time, and we were preaching the power of God was moving, and, and I remember this, this young lady was there, and, she was uh, helping out with their youth, the leader for their youth. And, and she's a believer. She loves the Lord, baptized in Jesus' name, filled with the Holy Ghost. And I didn't know that uh, she was born with one and a half lungs in her body. And so I, I, I you know, didn't realize that. Well, the funny thing is I went to go preach there. And the, the, the first day I went to go preach, she went to the hospital. I preached. And right after the message, she went to the emergency Kind of backwards there, right? You know what I'm talking about? You know, the preacher's supposed to preach and you get healed. You don't got to go to the hospital. So I'm thinking, man, what's going on? We're coming and people are getting sick instead of getting healed. I'm just kind of being transparent with everybody, all right? That's all right. So I remember thinking, all right, well, you know, let's, let's see what God's going to do. And so the following week, she came to church and she was out of breath because she had been born with one and a half lungs. So she lived that way for 27 years. But on that particular, the last past Sunday, her uh, half the lung had collapsed. So she's working now only on one lung. She went to the hospital. And, and I remember thinking, all right, well, you know, let's see if God's going to do something. And we began to preach and the power of God was moving. But I want to share something about that service. And I remember so clearly the atmosphere in that service. The atmosphere was set because of the people's worship. And they begin to release, and literally they begin to release themselves in the spirit and go ahead and worship and plug in so that God could do something. You know, worship is a sacrifice to God. And when you make that sacrifice, God responds on that sacrifice. And I remember all of a sudden people that didn't normally run, not the, not the normal runners that always get the miracle. I'm talking about people that didn't normally run, the ones that, you know, kind of just, you know, were there. They're good worshipers. They're worshipers here. They worship their way. But all of a sudden, something got a hold of. I remember one sister and she began to run all around that church and one, two, three began to follow her. And the power of God began to stir in that atmosphere. You see, the Bible says that he's the prince, the enemy is the prince of the air, right? So all of this. So when you begin to run and you begin to shout and you begin to proclaim things into the atmosphere. You let the enemy know, guess what? I'm coming to your territory. And I'm letting you know that I'm a believer in the name of Jesus. And that his kingdom is here today. And his kingdom is alive today. This no longer belongs to you. And all of a sudden, that young lady was there. And the power of God was moving in. Once again, remember, like I said, you know, I get kind of half crazy and then sometimes I revert back to oh, being on the other side of the blind lady. You know what I mean? Anybody know what I'm talking about? Yeah. You know, sometimes preachers know what I'm talking about. You just did the anointing. You step out and get up. And when you get to the car, you're like, man, did that just happen? <laughs> if it's Jesus, you better be saying, man, did that just happen? And so I remember all of a sudden I... I was there in the service, the anointing of God, the power of God was moving, and that young lady was in the front, and I remember I said, uh, I'm going to use you for a moment, and I, I went, would you stand up for me? There you go, thanks, brother, come on out for me. Can we give him a round of applause real quick? All right, there you go. You single to me? You single to me? Okay, all right, thank the Lord, praise God. Never mind. 
And so I remember all of a sudden as we were there, and I told that lady, I said, listen, I want you to go ahead and I want you to just jump. I want you to worship. I want you to begin to worship and jump and, and praise the Lord. And I begin to tell her, I want you to do something that you cannot do. I want you to do something you're not able to do. And she, she told me earlier, well, I can't jump. I, I can't really worship a whole lot because I'm only working on one lung. The doctor told me to relax this week. And he didn't even really want me to go to church. But I came to church because I know I got to. And she said, but, you know, I'm, I'm just going to keep it here. And so I remember, you know, watching her worship. And I said, listen, if you begin to do something that you cannot do, God is going to meet you halfway. And as God meets you halfway, he's going to take you the rest of the way. She was there just like the brother was, and she was lifting her hands for me. And she lifted her hands, and I remember telling her, come on, her name is Sharina. I said, Sharina, jump. I want you to jump. I want you to, to worship the Lord. I want you to just begin to jump, and God will heal you. Because God is my witness. I know this doesn't happen everywhere, and probably not in this church, but sometimes people don't listen to the preacher. So she said they're acting like she's in the Holy Ghost, speaking in tongues. Yeah, just like that. So I said, I'll oh, forget it, man. I'm going to pray for somebody else. I walked over and there was, is this all right? It's okay. All right. I walked over and prayed for another lady that uh, she was there and she had some kind of situation that affected her eyes and she couldn't see the screen. And I remember uh, the screen was, was a little bit closer than that one there about midway of uh, that first rail. And, and she said, uh, you know, I can't really see the screen. And I said, well, God's going to heal you. And we begin to pray. And then she, she, all of a sudden she looked, she said, I can see the screen now. God healed my body. And, and all of a sudden, as she's proclaiming this, and the people are worshiping and dancing. There's Sharina. And all of a sudden she starts jumping. Would you just jump for me real quick? But there you go. She's just jumping. Thank you. Just give him a round of applause. You can sit down now. And she's jumping and she's worshiping. She's dancing and doing a turn. And, and we're all looking over like, oh my goodness. She's either about to fall dead or be healed. You know, with God, there's no options. You know, you've got to have no plan B with God. It just works that way. Hey, God. I tell God that all the time when we first started evangelizing. I said, God, I'm about to get married, uh, but I have no job. I have no car. I have no place to, to live after our honeymoon. That's why I made it two weeks instead of one. I said, so if that's the case, then, and you don't make this evangelizing thing happen like you told me you would, then we're going to be on the street. I'm not going to have anywhere to live. That's why I told God. God's my witness. I remember all of a sudden, I began to tell that lady she was dancing and worshiping and jumping and just shouting to the Lord. And, and she told me later, she said, you know what, I, I, I got in my car after that service. And as I got into my car, I said, I felt the heat go down the left side of my body, the entire left side. And she said, and then all of a sudden I told God, God, if this is you, let it keep going. If it's not, I want you to stop it right now. And she said uh, that God allowed it to continue till the morning time. And as he allowed it to continue, she got up and she went back to the doctor. And to make a long story short, the doctor put cameras in her body and the doctor's looking there puzzled uh, scratching his head with her mom who birthed her with this defect in her lungs uh, and with Serena who was there in the office uh, and the doctor says well I don't really know what's going on uh, but all I can see on the, on the screen is you've got two completely uh, functioning lungs uh, inside of your body uh, that ought to make somebody sound right there because if you don't got it uh, he can make it uh, if you don't got it uh, Come, 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 with your hands lifted high. God is getting ready to do it. 